what you hear is God speaking to his people through his people. And you go, whoa, I hear you, you talking, uh, but I'm hearing God somehow in this. Uh, you're hearing me right now in a teaching. You hear the little vocal cords working, and, and you go, I'm getting non-physical reality communicated through these vocal cords on Murphy. And you see the same thing, ultimate sacrament, is Jesus himself. When the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so there are all types of things we can learn and know through matter, flesh and blood, in the case of Jesus, or the prophets, or the apostles, or you me, the church today. And so what second thing you start looking at with these promises is not only does he have this concept of providence, which almost embarrasses us because uh, he thinks he can take care of us and holds us in his hands, but then he also likes matter and doesn't think it's bad. You don't get all these teachings like if you ever really wanted to grow up in the Lord, you'd dump all these thoughts about stuff because stuff isn't good and it makes me angry, thus says the Lord. <laughs> but I'm sorry to tell you, read the book, he doesn't say that. And so what you end up with is, gosh, he worked all those days on the, building the Garden of Eden and creating the world and then plopped us in it. And then I see Jesus and listen to what he's saying. And, all the, and, I, and I realize there's a sacramental pro, pro, principle in play here and where God actually communicates through these physical channels. And I start going, this is not magic. That's the first thing I want to say. The story I used to tell all the time in Pauly's Island because in Pauly's Island they have 100 golf clubs in 15, 20-mile radius. It's everywhere. But there's stories like this that go around, and you may have heard this, but the, the three guys were playing golf. You had uh, Moses, Jesus, and this old man. And uh, they were playing golf, and Moses hit the golf ball and knocked it across the lake, but it was a little bit short, and it came down, but being Moses, when it came down, the lake parted, and, and the golf ball rolled up on the green. Marvelous. Jesus, you know the story. Next, he hit it, went much, much further, but still came down and just about hit the water, but being Jesus, it buckled, walked on across the uh, water and came up on to the cut, toward the cup within a couple of inches. And finally, the old man swung and he sliced it miserably and went way off into the woods and banged into a tree. A squirrel saw it, ran by, picked it up, ran off. A hawk came down, got the squirrel, flew out. Off it. A lightning struck the hawk. Hawk dropped the squirrel. Squirrel dropped the ball. Ball landed on the green, rolled four inches and into the cup. And <laughs> Jesus said, nice shot, Dad. In fact, <laughs> what you end up with these kinds of stories is the promises that I'm giving you from Scripture is not magic. Jesus actually thinks that he can take care of us. Not magic. Providence. Jesus actually thinks he will use material things to communicate non-physical reality, not magic, sacrament. And Jesus actually thinks that he can take us and hold us and that these promises are valid. I'll return to you. Trust me, I'm going to do it. You'll get back what you, what you give. You're learning how to be a giver. I am a giver. I gave my only begotten son. I give. You're learning to be like the Father. Well, begin practicing. I will supply your needs. Lighten up. I'll multiply your efforts. I'll, your giving will be rewarded. You'll experience a bounty. God will care for all of you need, all that type of stuff. And he actually means it. Now, we have a problem over here, and the problem is, no offense, Lord, but we want to do what we want to do, and since we don't believe this stuff, it's not very attractive. I think we know what's best, and since we don't believe that's, that's not very attractive, I lack the courage because I don't think I believe what you just said. No offense. I always say no offense so you won't get mad. Uh, I, I think I'm not a steward. I think I'm an owner. And so I'd rather talk about ownership. Why didn't Murphy come in here and do five hours on ownership instead of stewardship? Irritates me, but anyway. Money is ours. Uh, greed's a factor. Control's a factor. I don't think I'm going to get it back. I just don't. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm having some trouble believing that. I don't believe it. I have a scarcity mentality because I don't believe it. I'm selfish. And since I don't believe it, I'm going to take care of me. It's ours. Did I say that already? And I don't believe it. Did I say that already? So the issue becomes, oh, my gosh, wow, that's kind of serious. <laughs> We're having some No offense, Lord. I mean, no offense. But I'm having some trouble with all those wonderful, gushy feelings and thoughts. And so the question becomes for us, what in the world are we going to do with the reality that 
God is promising a lot from this kind of providential, hold you in his hands, thinks he's in charge, wants to give, wants to create things like the Garden of Eden, wants to make sure we're like lilies of the field and the birds and all that kind of thing. We're not going to be hurt. And we're not going to be damaged in one way or another. Uh, what, what do we do? The answer is going to be basic. Somehow, we've got to die to this. I'm sorry. You will never talk yourself out of them. Because if you're creative, you can think a lot more red stuff than just what we got on the newsprint. You could come up with seven or eleven other types of things like that. We've got to die to that. And the word that you find in the scriptures is repent. And that word is found everywhere. The problem with repent is it's one of those words that we hear all the time and we think we know what it means, but we may not know what it means. And so I, I, there's an analogy my dad, who used to be in the ministry, used to give, and I liked it, and, and it made sort of sense to me, and, and so I'm going to give it to you for what it is worth. But repentance would be something along these lines. Say that Matt Kessler and I are getting ready to go on a two-day conference that's going on just over here in Memphis. And we're kind of excited about this. We're taking off a few days. We want to get away, no offense, kick back, have some fun, hear some learn, teaching, whatever, but to go to a couple of nice restaurants and play a little bit. And I've been told that if you get on I-40 East, you could be there in a couple of hours. And so Matt and I flip a coin, who's going to drive? I lose the, the flip, so okay, I'll drive. And so I swing by early in the morning, 6 a.m., ask Matt to come on out. He's running out here. He, we go by at McDonald's, get some coffee, get some uh, whatever you eat for breakfast at McDonald's, and we're, we're turning up some music, rocking and rolling, found I-40, and headed out, and we'll be there in two hours. But just before, uh, nearly two hours has gone by, and we're chewing the fat and having a hoot, and we start coming up on signs that say Fort Smith, Oklahoma, 20 miles, and we go, what is going on? And, I, and we begin to say, oh, my gosh, what do we do? Now, I could feel bad and tell Matt that I feel bad. It was my responsibility to look the right direction on I-40, and instead of going I-40 east to get to Memphis, no offense, I kind of got I-40, but then I was going in the wrong direction. And I could tell him I felt bad, but that's not repentance. And I could say, Matt, in fact, I'm sorry. I am sorry that I've messed this thing up, and we got to stop this kind of thing. It's horrible. And that's wonderful, but that's not repentance. I could even tell him I have a burden of guilt that I'm experiencing right now as we zing on down toward Fort Smith, Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma. And so the reality is that Matt would say to me at some point, I think, Chuck, it's wonderful you feel sorry. It's wonderful you feel guilty. It's wonderful that you feel a burden of, of, but if you don't take the next exit and get off and go up over the ramp and head back the other direction, we will never get to Memphis. That is repentance. And that means that you've got to die to whatever you're doing that's not helpful and go in another direction altogether. And when we begin to do that, we begin to see a major theological point of God's call in our lives in the Scripture and in human history. God's call in our lives with reference to repentance is everywhere. And you're going to see it graphically in the prophets of the Old Testament again and again. It's a dominant theme of Scripture. I need you guys to repent. Not tell me how horrible you feel about yourself. Not tell me how guilty you feel. Not tell me what a slug bucket you are. All that kind of stuff. I don't want to know that. What I want you to do is repent. Go in a different direction. This, or you get to the John the Baptist, burst on the scene. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Hey, I, not you need to be a slug bucket. I need you to repent. Jesus started his ministry with repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so you see, and then at the end, and of course, again, throughout the Gospels, Jesus is talking about that. When he went and talked to Levi and he ate with all the Pharisees and people objected that he's sitting around, not Pharisees, but the tax collectors and, and people like that, the people objected to that. And he said, wait a minute, so the Son of Man came to call not the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. 
And so you start seeing this kind of concept and you start going, wow, that's what I need. That's what would make something change. And at the end of Luke's version of the Great Commission, he actually says, go out into all the world, teaching them to repent, calling them to repent. So the thought you have again and again and again is we've got to move in another direction. And it's not the direction that we've been heading on. The direction that he would have us move is the one that you see in the center uh, newsprint here. And someone nailed it a minute ago. Uh, what do you think your life would look like if you took this seriously and turned back this other way? You guys said, not me, you guys said, I guess I'd have a deeper relationship with God. Somebody else said the same thing. I guess I'd feel more freedom. Somebody else said the same thing. I guess I'd feel blessing. Somebody else said the same thing. I guess my life would be filled with joy. And, and, and I guess I would display the gospel in my life. I'd feel less fear. I'd feel less stress. I'd have softened hearts, less fear, more peace. Basically, we call it, the, we think this is what it would look like. What Jesus called it was, and someone said this, he called it the abundant life. And what he said is, I want you to turn from the direction that you're moving and move toward a life that I want for you. And the life that I want for you is what I would call the abundant life, John 10, 10 type of thing. And it will put a smile on your face and you will be able to experience what the Father wants for you anyway. He is not constantly trying to slap the smile off your face. He actually wants you to be happy. He invented the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, all this type of stuff. You have. He, that's what He wants for you. But if we stay over in this world, I'm sorry, it's not a happy experience. And it ain't love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness. And so you end up saying, well, I don't know if I can take the leap. That's like a leap of faith. Bingo. <laughs> I, I, that's, that'd be like, wow, I'm not sure I've resolved all my problem issues. Bingo. I would just have to, like Abraham, I'd like to just head out. And Jesus basically says, that's what I want for you. And he will use all types of things to help us get there. He, Jesus, his own ministry. He, and he'd use material stuff to, to wine and dine you. I mean, he just would. If you look at the first miracle of Canaan and Galilee, what's he do? He turns water into wine. It's a very material kind of thing. But if you read that passage, it ends with the statement, and they believed in him. 